O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. So I think that may be the longest gospel passage ever, <laughs> um, which warrants yet another sip of my, my Celsius heat caffeine drink. In any case, this gospel is all about sight and blindness. And it reminds me, when I was in college, I had a job, I had a lot of different odd jobs doing work study, and one of them was in the dance department. And basically, we hung the lights, which you can never call lights, they were instruments, but we hung the lights for all of the dance performances, and one of the things uh, that we had to do was make sure that there were these gels that went in front of the lights so that there was the right um, color in the performance. And so I was reminded of that because this gospel passage is all about what are the lenses that you are looking at the world through. And sometimes you may think that your vision is accurate, but your lenses might actually be distorting things. And anyone who wears glasses knows this. I have to get new ones because I'm, I'm having to hold the gospel book farther and farther away. But it's all about what is your spiritual sight? What is your spiritual sight? And in this long, long passage, it looks at that from a bunch of different angles. So we're going to break it down a little bit. So first there are the disciples. And they start this um, whole sequence by asking Jesus, when they come upon this blind man, who sinned? Who sinned? And why do they ask that question? Well, it's kind of the question that is a big part of our lives. Why do bad things happen to good people, right? Or maybe just why do bad things happen? And so they have an implicit assumption. And what is their assumption? Yeah, right? Like if something bad happened to you, it's your fault. You must have done something wrong. And so the disciples are looking at the world through lenses of shame and blame. And it's very common for a lot of us, right? We all are really good at finding blame, whether it's out there in the world or maybe if you're like me, you know, sort of pointing it inward. Who's to blame for what has happened, right? But Jesus says, that is a waste of time. That is a complete waste of time. Nobody sinned. It's not about sin. This man was born blind as an opportunity to live with compassion and to demonstrate God's healing in the world. And that's, in fact, what Jesus does. So the disciples have to learn to take off those lenses of shame and blame that they are viewing the world through. But there are lots of different lenses that we might view the world through. And if you think of that first passage that Sally read, the passage about David, when David is chosen, that's all about a different set of lenses that sometimes we look through. And I call it the lenses of outward appearances in this society, sometimes money, right? Basically, in that story, Samuel is sent out to anoint a new king. And at first he thinks, right, it's the oldest brother, the tall, handsome one. How many of us for, have fallen for that, right? But no, then there's this parade of brothers, and finally it's the youngest brother, the smallest one who is out in the field with the sheep. And what is the key line in that passage? Mortals look at the outward appearance of things, but the Lord looks at the heart, right? So that line talks about another kind of distorted lens or a lens that distorts our vision of the world and asks us to take those lenses off and to look at life the way God looks at it. I was at um, a dinner party last month kind of a cocktail slash dinner party. And unfortunately, I got cornered by this fellow. And 
he had everything bigger and everything better and got everything cheaper no matter what the topic of conversation was. And you've probably all been to dinner parties or cocktail parties like that, right? And so, so that was an example of looking at the world totally based on outward appearances. He had a bigger house, he had a bigger car, right? And so all of that was basically about money. And so that was kind of a lens that was distorting his vision. And it was certainly not all that enjoyable either, and I quickly had to make an exit. What's another type of lens that sometimes we look through the world at and distorts our vision? What do the Pharisees, um, what's their lens? What would you say? The law, yep. Any other way of putting that? What's that, Lynn? Black and white, sort of a rigidity, a certitude, I would say control. The Pharisees are looking at the world as they think it's supposed to be. So here's this miracle that happens, right? This guy receives his sight, and you'd think they would throw a party. You think they would say, wow, someone in our community who was broken is now healed. This is so wonderful. Let's all celebrate. But what do they do instead? What's that? Yeah, they cast them out. They're totally fixated on the fact that God did not act as God was supposed to act. How many of us, right, have often prayed for something to come into our life? Maybe it's a new relationship, a new situation, uh, especially a relationship, right? And then someone comes into your life and you're like, um, I wasn't actually praying for that type of person. Um, I want some other type of person, God. So it's, it's whenever we have a sense of this is how it's supposed to be. This is how I feel in control. This is what I'm comfortable with. And when God does something new, different, and unexpected, we don't want to see it. So that's another kind of lens that sometimes we look at the world through, and it distorts our ability to see. I'm going to read, of course, from Richard Rohr, and he says this, especially about that last lens. I wonder if the only way that conversion, enlightenment, and transformation ever happen is by a kind of divine ambush. We have to be caught off guard. As long as we are in control, we are going to keep trying to steer the ship by our previous experience of being in charge. The only way we will let ourselves be ambushed is by trusting God the ambusher and learning to trust that the confusion and darkness of intimacy will lead to depth, safety, freedom, and love. God needs to catch us by surprise because our very limited pre-existing notions keep us and our understanding of God small. God tries to bring us into a bigger world. Have any of you heard the joke about the guy who is praying that God will rescue him. He's in a flood, and he's praying that God will rescue You know this one, Jim, right? So there's this guy, there's a flood, and you know, his house is filling up very quickly, and um, he's praying that God will rescue him from the flood. And so a rowboat comes along, and the guy in the rowboat says, hey, get in, the flood waters are rising, right? And the man says, no, 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 I'm praying that God will rescue me, and so it's okay, um, you know, you can move along. So then the waters rise a little higher, they're at his waist now, and then uh, a Coast Guard boat comes along and says, hey, get in the boat, the waters are rising. And the guy says, no, no, I am trusting in the Lord, God is going to rescue me, it's totally fine. And so the Coast Guard guys are like, okay, and so they move on to the next house. And then finally, the waters have risen so high that the guy is standing on his roof. And a helicopter comes, and the guy in the helicopter says, hey, get in. The waters are still rising. Your house is going to be underwater. 
and the guy says, no, no, I am praying to God that he will rescue me, and I know he's going to do so. So the helicopter guy moves on. And then sadly, the waters continue to rise, and the man dies. And so he goes to heaven, and he gets past the pearly gates uh, and St. Peter, and he's able to talk to God. And he says, you know, God, I had a really great life um, up until that flood. And so I've got a question for you. You know, why didn't you rescue me? I trusted in you, and you didn't rescue me. And God says, my child, I sent a rowboat. I sent the Coast Guard. I sent a helicopter. What more did you want? So a funny joke but it gets across this notion that this man was looking through life with a certain lens of how God was going to act, and he couldn't see it when God finally did act. So this is Rose Sunday, or Pink Sunday, as I like to call it, and so we're all pretty in pink today. It's halfway through Lent. It's kind of a breather in the middle of the Lenten fast. And I think it offers an opportunity once more to sit back and kind of look at, look at uh, how's Lent going, whether you've taken on or any Lenten practices, and just to ask that question again, how am I living my life? How am I living my life? And are there ways that I am looking at the world that distort things from me, distort things from me, and are an obstacle to living fully in God. And can I just try to take those glasses off or lift them a little bit so that I might be able to say, once I was blind, but now I see. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.